right. Well, uh, uh, first, I, I should begin by saying I didn't expect to be interviewed myself. And, um, and uh, Father Robert Carboneau is going to be interviewing me. So I'm actually, in a way, introducing myself. Uh, and I'm, I'm so honored, uh, again, to be with Father Carboneau. Uh, interestingly, I've never been nervous until uh, last night. And it was the first time I was personally nervous because uh, I knew that Father, Father Carboneau would be interviewing me and, and sort of frantically was writing notes uh, last night and this morning, uh, even through my breakfast. But in any case, I, I really don't know what to say about myself before Father Carboneau asked the first question, other than, um, uh, you know, just by way of introduction, other than I, I, I focus on the Qing dynasty, you know, late Qing, perhaps sort of maybe into the into the Republican era. And, uh, and my work is, is, is like the rest of the scholars in the series is, is focused on the history of Christianity in China. But other than that, um, since I, I'm nervous and maybe uh, <laughs> want to move along, Father Carbono, I'll just hand it over to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Clark. It's uh, good to be able to have this. And um, I'll start by asking you a basic question. These are the questions that you've been asking the other scholars. This is the first question. What brought you to the field of China Christianity studies, and why are you interested in particular? In what areas are you interested in particular uh, for research? Uh, you started to say it was a chain and into the Republican. What brought you to this, and what specific areas have uh, been of interest to you? Why, well, right? Well, uh, you know, it, I. So I come to this this particular interview having interviewed a, a lot of other people. So in a way. Um, I'm, I'm very familiar with how many people have answered this question. And one of the things many people have said that, it, that please stay to, please stay to your own. Oh, <laughs> my own narrative. <laughs> your own narrative. We don't, at this point, we're asking you about you, not okay. the other scholars. Be respectful of your own uh, self-worth here. Okay. Well, I, so I didn't come to Christ, the, 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 the field of China Christianity studies as my principal interest. I mean, in the very beginning, uh, uh, I was, um, I, I was uh, in, from my very first day in college, my major was always Chinese history and Chinese language and literature. And so my first interest was really in the Han Dynasty. Um, maybe I thought a little bit about how I wanted to be like Matteo Ricci and how I wanted to be one of these great sinologists who were uh, you, you know, who, like those in the past. But, you know, my first work was on the historian Bangu from the Eastern Han Dynasty. And I, my first book was actually about uh, Bangu's writing of history and how he framed history in his Hanshu, his history of the Han. And, and then I, as I was finishing my, my dissertation and thinking about turning it into a, a, my first book, just before I defended my dissertation, uh, I went to, full, uh, to Taiwan as a Fulbright scholar and uh, this was an interesting year, uh, fully funded by two different agencies. And the Fulbright gave me this lavish budget to buy books. And I remember buying boxes of books and shipping them back home and spending time with people like the other Fulbright scholar was Stephen Platt, who was a, a student of Jonathan Spence, who worked uh, just recently published on the, on the Taiping Rebellion. And so he and I are talking about Christianity in China. And that kind of began to plant a seed as I'm working on the Han Dynasty. And uh, that, uh, that those early discussions made me sensitive to this history of Christianity in China. And uh, I was working in the Jesuit collection, Jesuit library there in Taipei, and uh, looking at some, they had a great library of sinological texts. And there was a, a, a Chinese a folio beside me of documents on the, on the Christian martyrs who died during the Boxer Uprising. And I began to read these accounts. And as I'm reading these accounts, it struck me how deeply moved I was. I mean, the Han Dynasty was interesting, but it didn't move me. <laughs> and reading about these Boxer uh, accounts really moved me. And so that sort of began a, lot, a, a new interest in reading about the, the history of, of Christianity in China. And then I should say, just by way of sort of concluding my answer to that first question, my doctoral mentor was a man by the name of Stephen Durant. And Stephen Durant was a great Han Dynasty scholar of Sima Qian. 
and uh, which is why I studied from him because you know, he was one of the people who could, could guide me in my work on, on the Han Dynasty and Bangu. But his professor, his mentor was a, was a scoot father priest from Belgium by the name of Father Paul Sorois. Mm -hmm. and, and Father Sorois uh, was a great intellectual of the history of the church, but he was also a scholar in oracle bones, Chinese oracle bones, a scholar of ancient Chinese texts. He was a grammarian, so a classical sonologist in that way. But I never met Father Sorois, but I would hear about, about Father Sorois almost weekly from Professor Durant. And in, in China studies, there is, this, um, there is this notion of lineage, just like in, in, in Confucianism and in and, and personal family histories in China. There's a very a strong consciousness of lineage. Even Christians say, Washer Yi Dai, Washer San Dai, I'm third generation or first generation Christian. Well, Father Sorois's first mentor while he was a missionary in Shanxi, China, Father Sorois's first mentor was Father Teilhard de Chardin. And so Teilhard de Chardin influenced Father Sorois's intellectual way of thinking. And then Father Sorois went to Berkeley where he studied from some of the great sonologists, Peter Budberg, Zhao Yuanren, um, um, a Wolfram Eberhard, some of the old school sonologists. But I guess I should say then that my own lineage, intellectual lineage, um, comes from a long line of priests of, of Catholic priests who were either missionaries in China or intellectuals in China, or who had themselves studied from uh, 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 Chinese missionaries. And, um, and, then, and then finally, I, I, this, this, all this coalesced into a decision after writing my first book, I'm going to dedicate myself to the history of Christianity in China. And then by the way, the last, the last sort of thing I should say about, about this uh, is that uh, my interest began to work to be to focus on the history of martyrdom, um, these topics came to me in a way. I, I didn't really select them. I, I, I remember visiting a number of villages in Shanxi Province, uh, and and meeting local Catholics and them talking about their personal histories, uh, and being the grandchildren or great grandchildren of boxer martyrs, and thinking, you know, I should maybe conduct a little more research on this Franciscan mission in Shanxi. So it was these encounters with local Christians who inspired me to tell their story. I once asked a Chinese Christian, what do you, Chinese Catholic, what do you want us who are non-Chinese to do? I mean, what would, what would your wish be? And, and I heard uh, this, this, this very sort of elderly, um, what do we call them? Uh, um, um, the Huizhang, the sort of church elder, said to me, tell our story. Uh, let other people know about our story here in China, because we're part of the universal church. Um, and then that's, that's, that inspired that interest in the, the boxers that was Shanxi. I read Favier's journal that he wrote while he was in the cathedral during the boxer uprising. And then as, after I finished that journal, I was sitting in Beitong Church in, in Beijing, and I thought, this is where he was when he was experiencing this boxer history. So that inspired me to write that book. But as I was writing that book, my, the chair of my department at the University of Alabama took me into his office and he said, you know, Tony, uh, uh, this, this topic, Christianity in China, will never take hold. And he said, you really should stop writing about this topic and go back to your Han Dynasty writing because especially writing about martyrdom, no one will care about that. And interestingly, um, this sort of history of, of sinological lineage, this history of interest shifting into the history of Christianity in China, and then, and then my chair saying, oh, this will never take hold. And then that book, once it was published, I, I was invited to give talks, oh, all over the place. And I remember um, just feeling so gratified that there was an actual interest in this field. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and that really, I think, is the that really is, 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 is what brought me into this, this field. And, and also, I have to say, the friendships with my fellow scholars has been very rewarding. It's a very congenial uh, field. Uh, you might be touched upon this a little bit. Uh, and, and I guess in all these types of situations, a lot of these um, reflections can uh, combine in so many different factors. But uh, the question that, all of us have been asked is describe a research discovery 
uh, that made you think differently about the topic. You sort of alluded to the diary in Beijing Church, the the martyrdom narratives, but uh, perhaps can you be a little bit more um, precise or or conceptual to to dig into that idea a little bit more? I mean, that, I hear that those first two aspects of stories, but talk a little bit about the research uh, uh, in process that that if you maybe take a couple examples, if you will. Well, <clears throat> there, there are really, I, I'm sort of thinking about this. There's so many moments of discovery. Historians, unlike literary scholars or theologians, for example, historians who work in archives sometimes make these great discoveries. And sometimes they call it those eureka moments. And, and there are many of those, but I think two really strike me as significant in my own scholarly work. One is uh, when I was working in the, um, what they call the Biblioteca Apostolica Vaticana, the, the, literally the Pope's private library that the, the Pope opens up for scholars. And I was working through a collection of, uh, of Jesuit documents from the 17th century, Giulio Eleni and uh, uh, Buglio, many of these people. And um, thinking about you know, first off, the material of the texts, you know, what were these texts like that these Jesuits, you know, the, the, the first editions of these texts are held in the Vatican Library. And I was looking at one particular text. I won't reveal which one it was and who the, who the, who the missionary was, but I was looking at one particular text in the Vatican Library. And, you know, it's one of the world's most famous libraries. And on, on the page of, uh, on several pages, there were these little, uh, 17th or 18th century slips of paper that had been sort of glued, adhered to cover, to obscure certain sections of the text. And I remember thinking uh, in, in the, here I am in the Vatican library, and there are these things that are covered, you know, almost like modern post-it notes. And I thought, well, I want to know what was covered, <laughs> but I don't want to tear something off of a rare document in the Vatican and get into trouble. But I did carefully sort of lift the edges and um, wrote down what was, was uh, written. And <clears throat> what was fascinating about that is that uh, in the 18th or 17th century, these missionaries were writing and theorizing about things that the Catholic Church would theologically and doctrinally find very strange. Um, th this particular book was writing about how um, there was a belief that Moses wasn't transfigured, but was actually resurrected. And, uh, and that was covered, and there were other things of that nature. And then in later editions, that was not, um, that was not uh, included. The text was changed. It was, it was, that was, section was redacted. Well, what did I discover then? I discovered that um, first, I, I, looked at, I had looked at the digital versions of these books, some of these books, and that text was not visible. I literally had to be there and try my best without damaging the glued slips to look underneath and to discover uh, that history is complicated and that, our, that the actual, the act of being in the archive with the document itself is sometimes crucial. Um, digitized texts often don't include the slips that are the ephemera that is, that is placed within the text. So one discovery was that you can make discoveries when you're physically there. And that was, that was, uh, uh, that was quite a, 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 quite, uh, for me, quite, it helped me to reframe and redirect how I thought about, about research. That is, I've made a strong effort to go to archives. Um, second, I, I was in, someone had told me many years ago, there's really nothing you can do in China. In, fa in fact, I'll tell the, who the person was. It was Jin Lu Xian, the Bishop of Shanghai. And I had written him a letter and he always graciously wrote me back. And I said, is there a way for me to conduct research in these areas in China? And he said, everything's gone. Everything's gone. It's, he, was, he was very depressed about it, actually, in his letter. Everything's gone. There's nothing we can do. I, I recommend that you visit archives in, in Rome uh, and elsewhere. But I decided, uh, for once, I'm just going to go against what Jin Lushen uh, mentioned. I went to visit villages. Uh, I'm well, thinking of one village in Gu Chengying, in, Sha, in, Sha, in Shanxi province called Gu Chengying. 
and there were, was a, a really uh, intense attack by the boxers on the church. And uh, one of the things that when I was interviewing the uh, local Catholics, one of the things that they mentioned is, you know, my grandfather uh, remembers that his father during the Boxer Uprising, bo boxer uprising um, had all of these stone stele, these monuments made that recorded what was going on in this village during the Boxer Uprising, the names who have died, the, the, the accusations that were made against the Christians, um, the state, the, the, the local documents that were, that, that uh, accused the Christians of being white lotus rebels and the like. And these things were all put on these stele and then lined up outside the church. The Cultural Revolution comes along, 1950s, they're very nervous. They took all of those stele and they put the words on the exterior and they lined them in, in, and then covered them in dirt and turned them into a water culvert. Mm -hmm. So these stele had been kept since I think it was the 1950s, kept as, a, <clears throat> as just a, a ditch. And uh, when I was visiting, someone said, well, we just uncovered those and they're in, the, they're in the storage room at the church. And so I went into the storage room and lo and behold, these incredible stele were lined up. We cleaned them off. I photographed each one very carefully, uh, transcribed the text and, and uh, what incredible information was found on these stele. Uh, and then again, I was in Dongargo village and the Franciscans after the Boxer Uprising had taken these old Qing stele and used them as steps to, to enter into a section of the, the, the Franciscan seminary in Dongargo. Um, and sadly, the, the word, the, the inscription was up. So uh, when I was visiting there, I cleaned off those stele with my with a water bottle and discovered that this was a post-Boxer uprising, boxer uprising source on these stele. Much of, of it would have been obscured by, by walking on it. So I guess the second discovery was uh, that you really can learn a lot if you go to the villages and just get to know the local people. Um, they have their own rich local history, even in their memory, oral history uh, is, is fascinating. So I guess the, the, those two things, this this idea of going to the archives and going to the villages, going to these locations, those are the things that help me reframe and re redirect that that really have informed greatly uh, my own scholarship and my own writing. Um, those are very interesting stories because I think they encourage people who might be listening to us and all scholars and aspects to remember about the energy, the work, um, uh, a dedication to go and find something and um, spend the time to do that uh, type of research and that it's worth some kind of effort and the surprise that comes along. And that, that leads to the third question, um, the most meaningful moment that you've experienced in China or elsewhere, which, uh, uh, you know, while conducting your research, um, and I'm going to add a, a, a question here that sort of maybe other people might be interested in hearing from you is you've been a prolific writer, you know, to your credit. So uh, maybe a meaningful moment of experience in China or elsewhere, but even in the writing process, maybe combine the two and give all of us who try to turn out books or, or articles or are intimidated by this some perspective on both those things. I think that could be very helpful for anyone listening to this. Yeah. Um, wow, I like that second part quite a lot too. Um, I guess to answer the first part, I was reflecting on this meaningful moments. Uh, many people have, who are scholars have meaningful moments in many places, not just in China. Um, but, but I think for me at least, uh, it's those moments of encounter those moments where I'm with people in China, um, either maybe in mass or maybe after mass or maybe before mass or maybe sitting on, on the, the steps of the church after mass, just ch chatting with some elderly uh, Christian, elderly Catholic woman about her life as a Christian in China. Those have been very meaningful. Uh, I guess two, two things strike me, um, sort of brief little accounts. 
One was in 2008. Uh, I was, when I'm in China, uh, I, I typically uh, will go to uh, West Church. And uh, this is in Beijing. This is in Beijing, right? This is in Beijing at Xitang. And while I was at West Church, I got to know a couple, uh, the organist and the choir director, and uh, who had children that they named Peter and Paul. <laughs> but, but this couple uh, knew another choir director from another church in, in Beijing who, uh, who knew the last surviving, and, and I'll, I'll be very uh, prudent in how I describe this, but I think uh, I can say a few things about this, 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 uh, uh, this experience. I was thinking about the history of the church and monasticism, just sort of thinking about China is one of the very few countries with a Catholic presence without a monastic culture, no, no monasteries. And I remember asking, you know, talking about music and talking about chant and talking about this history of monastic uh, 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 polyphony and all of that. But the subject went to this 1947 Trappist monastery that ended up having, a, you know, the monks were taken on a death march in 1947 and many of them died in the process. And, um, and then after that process in the, in the late 1940s and early 1950s, a few of the surviving monks established a dairy farm in Be Beijing. Um, all of them had passed away except for one of the monks who, was, who lived through that entire experience. And the choir director from another church uh, took me to the home of the last surviving Trappist monk, oh. who was such a joyful man. Um, just a great, joyful uh, person. You know, he, I, I thought, I, I had assumed that I would go visit this last surviving monk who really survived this harrowing thing, that he would be a solemn personality. But goodness, no, he was uh, full of laughter and joy. And we sat and we, we drank tea together. Um, and and he, he really was, he was very elderly and, and he was very open with his story. So uh, I was able to film that and, uh, and uh, one of the, 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 the uh, local uh, Catholics transcribed the entire thing and, and then we just sort of archived it and kept it away. But that, that experience of meeting someone who knows someone who knows someone else who ended up driving us through this really remote uh, uh, suburban uh, neighborhood in Beijing and then meeting this, this incredibly uh, uh, this incredibly joyful uh, uh, man who who had memory, personal memories of such a significant historical event, that really um, that really uh, moved me. And then and then another account that I should say very briefly is that I, I I teach a course on the history of Buddhism, one of my favorite classes, and uh, my students uh, often will say, you know, Buddhism is is so fascinating and. And but we here in America we think of Zen gardens and we think of you know Buddhist statues in Chinese restaurants or Buddhist statues in front of people's houses. What is Buddhism like in situ in you know in China? So uh, I was teaching a course in China, uh, focused largely. You know, part of the class was focused largely on Buddhism, and so we went to Wu Tai Shan, which is this Buddhist pilgrimage site, and uh, we were there in in Wu Tai Shan on a Sunday. And the person who was orchestrating all of our, all of our uh, uh, transportation noticed that some of the Christians on Sunday had organized a bit of a, you know, their own sort of prayer group. And this man uh, broke down and revealed to the entire group of students that he was an underground Christian. And he had always wanted to be with uh, non-Chinese who he knew were Christian so that he would feel connected with, with others. And uh, he, he asked a special request. He said, may I read the opening of the Gospel of John to, to the students in Chinese? Well, most of my students didn't speak Chinese. Some did. Uh, but he did, well, as tears were rolling down his, his face, he read the Gospel, the first half of the Gospel of John. And, and what was what was interesting about that moment is how contagious those tears were to everyone in the room. There, was a, there were a lot of watery eyes as people were experiencing this local Christian who was for the first time in his life connecting with Christians outside of China. And that was moving to me because it reminded me that the people in, in archives are not mere abstractions. Um, these people uh, 
that I read about were very much like this man, right? And his, his experience was, in a way, the experience of those about whose lives I studied. Uh, weeks later, he brought the entire group. That moved him so much. Just reading the Gospel of John with, with Americans moved him so much. He went to a, a village, bought crates of gift apples, drove them to Beijing, showed up at our dorm rooms with these gift apples and gave apples to the whole group. And, you know, this is a bunch of American kids from Washington State, an apple country who didn't think apples existed in China, right? And they're eating apples and having this really great moment with this person. So that was very special to me. And then um, I should say another very quick moment is uh, two meetings I had with Jin Lushen. The first one, uh, he was very... Um, and Jin Lushen, just remind people who Jin Lushen is. So Jin Lushen is the, uh, he was the Bishop of Shanghai and uh, very complicated history, was imprisoned for quite a while and became the Bishop of Shanghai and really rebuilt the Diocese of Shanghai. Was a Jesuit, uh, received his doctorate in the, at the Gregorian in Rome, uh, was a polyglot, so he spoke many, many languages. When, when I first met him, he spoke to me in French. I said, well, it's not my native language. I, my native language is English. He, then he switched into fluent English with me, and I just thought, this is really impressive. So typical of many, many of the sort of Jesuits of that era, you know, the sort of language uh, uh, um, levels of language mastery. But the first time I met him, he was very, very smooth and very, I would say, careful. And of course, he, he, he was smooth and careful. I mean, we were in his rectory or in his, in his bishop's residence next to St. Ignatius Cathedral in Beijing. <clears throat> we had a long chat. Uh, we had corresponded in the past, but then the second time we met, uh, I decided I would bring him a gift of photographs from the Jesuit archive in, in Vanf of 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 the, the the mission during his life there. Pictures of himself, pictures of himself with a birthday cake behind him, pictures of his spiritual mentor, his Jesuit, his father Lefebvre, and uh, pictures of the of many of his friends. And and the first time I met Jin Lushen, he was very careful. But when I gave him the photographs at, at 95 or 96, or however old, he, was, he was quite elderly, very spry though, uh, he, he became very emotional. And he stared at these photographs and Jin Lushen, the very careful bishop, the survivor bishop, looked up to me with watery eyes and said, he held the picture and said, these are treasures to me, thank you. I love these men and these are my friends, thank you. And then he called in his, he had a, a, a nurse, um, that would that would take care of him and give him all of his shots. And Jin Lushen said, please treasure these and keep these near me. Um, that was a powerful moment that uh, we all have our exterior self. And we also have that, what I would call maybe a more authentic self. About writing, um, goodness, I mean, my, my, own, my own theory of process is that I just stay at it. And... Um, it's become more interesting, I think. That is, people more often write for others. They write for presses. They write for audiences. And, you know, the first thing an editor will say to you, who's your audience? They love to say that to you. Who's your audience? Write to your audience. I've personally, me personally, I've never written to an audience. I, I've written for um, those who I think uh, this story would be important. Um, of course, I, I, I try to write as an academic, right? It's because I, I want to, I think that the academic community needs this field so much. So, um, you know, I, I am Catholic. So there is the, the, the sort of Catholic dimension of, of me that cares about these things on a, on a sort of faith basis. But then there is that intellectual level, not that they're separate, not that they're even always aligned. But, um, but it has been a really great exercise for me to just stay at that process and to write for the academic community and, and write in a way that uh, if my advisor once said to me, I remember as a doctoral student, I said, how shall I present the, when I, a person that I write about? And he said, present uh, the life of that person according to the texts, right? What do you see in the text and, and tell the truth. That is the, um, that is the, uh, the commitment of the scholar is to tell the truth. So I've always tried to do that, good or bad. Um, and, uh, uh, and the other thing is, I, I think that the last thing I can say about writing is you have to love it. I mean, 
when you love your writing, it's, it's, it's in a way, it's like the, the, the man reading the gospel of John and crying, uh, loving how we write inspires others in a way to have the same response. Um, I always say, don't let the editors and readers uh, sort of in a way ruin the process, right? Um, love what you write, write it with, uh, with meaning and honesty, and then, and then work it out uh, when you edit. But yeah. I think that would be helpful for many people who would anticipate that and have actually read your books and articles. So I think that's a good insight and in, in that the way you approach that. Uh, we, the fourth question here uh, is, recall a pleasant memory you have regarding another scholar uh, in your field uh, and something that should be remembered about uh, that history in our field. Well, um, I'm going to take a liberty and talk about three very briefly. First, it's quite a fun opportunity because <clears throat> here <clears throat> I can talk about the person who's the interviewer. So, um, in, 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 you know, I mentioned earlier how, how wonderful it is in this field that we have such a congenial community. And that's special. I remember uh, going to conferences uh, as, a, as a doctoral student and as a new PhD, where in many of the old school classical philologists or the sinologists who I, I still admire very much would say, oh, the field has gone downhill, or uh, the, no one has mastered the text as they should have mastered the texts. Um, and there was a great deal of sort of lament about how the field has collapsed. Well, in, in this field, I never hear that. What I hear is, welcome to the field. Um, we, need, we need you to be part of this, this, this community. Uh, for some reason, the field of China Christianity studies is one of collaboration, uh, we actually, I don't think I've met anyone who doesn't like the field or who thinks the field is going downhill. Everyone's very optimistic about this field. And that's been very, very, uh, very refreshing. But I should say about you, Father Carboneau, um, we have chatted quite a lot over the phone about our ideas, about our scholarship. Um, there have been moments uh, just with you in particular, where in uh, uh, You've talked about your work in Wu Tang. I've talked about a book that I was writing about, and, and, and maybe you don't know this, but I was carefully taking notes uh, because those notes were influencing how I think about the topic, and um, and that has changed the even the trajectory of my own writing. So that has been a gift to me. That has been a great gift to me. I should mention. Um, and it's, it's funny too, because I, uh, I spend a great deal of my time, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in what I might call ecclesial circles, right? With, and maybe not even always, but, but I mean, what I mean by that is I've gotten to know quite a few priests because uh, there are many, many priests who are interested in the, in the history of the church in China, the Catholic church in China, even Orthodox. I have spent some time with Orthodox priests in Beijing and that was quite, quite enlightening. But I should say a very brief thing about Father Mariani. He and I in 2010, Paul Mariani is a Jesuit who teaches at Santa Clara. And uh, uh, he and I traveled to China in 2010. And we went to uh, Hong Kong. We, well, we first landed in Taiwan. We spent some time in Taiwan looking at archives. And then we, then we went to uh, mainland China and we spent some time in Shanghai. We went up into Beijing, spent some time in Beijing, went to Shanxi province and then traveled back down to Hong Kong and did, did work in Hong Kong. So it was, it seems like it was about a month of just intense travel and research. And um, I should say it was interesting with him in particular uh, because he's, he's, he's um, a scholar, very interested in, in the, 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 uh, the scholarly work, the scholarly enterprise of our field, but also is, you know, a priest. And, uh, and something I had not really thought about, uh, the sort of the more ministerial aspect. He never really sort of, he never revealed himself as a priest, but certainly when we would be in a village, uh, the priest would always say to me, are you a priest? No, they would say to him, are you a priest? Yes. Well, what was interesting about that, that experience <clears throat> is I didn't expect to see the, the local practice of faith. Uh, usually I'm gathering information. Uh, when Father Mariani was there, I, I remember one instance, we were at a village in Shanxi province and uh, 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 the local Huizhang, the local 
church elder said, well, you're a priest and our priest has, the, has very little opportunity to come. We have some sick people who would love to just receive your blessing. Well, within, within a half an hour, some very ill people and deformed people came out, uh, people who couldn't stand uh, with, with deformities and great, a great deal of suffering, tears in their eyes as Father Mariani would just bless them. That was very powerful. We went to a, a, a village called Liolitsun, 9,000 Catholics in this village. And he was very interested in his own scholarship too. But uh, as we showed up, the, the priest said, let's go in and look at our collection of materials. And, and, and as I was entering uh, uh, this room, uh, they asked, are you a priest? Are you a priest? And he said he was. Then they asked him to go outside and bless people. Hundreds of faithful lined up. And he blessed them for, uh, it must have been 40 minutes. And I felt terrible because here I am inside looking at these documents. <laughs> <laughs> and he was outside blessing people. And, and to me, um, uh, there was something really profoundly moving about, about that moment. And then finally, I should say something about John Paul Wiest. And that is, uh, John, Paul, uh, John Paul Wiest uh, reminds me of how much energy scholars have in this field. He's, he, I would say he's in a sort of uh, final season of life. Uh, uh, he's tired. Um, and I don't think he would mind me saying this, but what impresses me so much about John Paul Wiest is just a few years ago, he said, there is a collection of photographs of Vincent Leb and the Samus held in Brussels. And uh, he said, these images are languishing in this archive that is, is fundamentally closed. Thousands, thousands of great photographs of him, of other missionaries, Samist missionaries, all in their Belgian missionaries. And he invited me to go to Brussels with him and digitize these photographs. Well, I, I went with uh, my wife and I went with a student and we spent days and days going through thousands of photographs with a scanner that we shipped there to, to Brussels, digitizing these, these photographs, spending our days talking about Vincent Leb, looking at documents, a shirt that Vincent Leb wore was sort of right next to me as I worked in this archive. And I remember thinking, you know, how, how interesting it was that so many people think about Vincent Leb as this heroic sort of Catholic intellectual missionary in China who was in favor of the indigenization of the church. Uh, in, in China, um, you know, and, and they, 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 you know, I've, I've known people searching for images on the internet of Vincent Leb, and here I was with the original photographs. Here I was with his shirt next to me, and uh, and and John Paul, of course, you know, working away identifying people because he has this incredible memory of all of these people, and uh, he is spending his days identifying persons in these images and 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 we are creating this this database of uh, of, of photographs with with the identities with the metadata of all of these churches and places and people and he is just so impressive to me because uh, uh, he is still as strong now as he was before in his work and um, and then finally he he wants um, I, I had mentioned to him, I want to write a book on the Jesuits in, in uh, Hebei province, in what used to be called Jirli. And uh, he said, well, I have some documents uh, in, in, uh, you know, in my house, I think in downstairs related to that, um, that my wife, his wife, Nileen, uh, that my wife and I had sort of compiled and, and, and thought about and worked through. And he'd written an article about these, these Jesuits uh, some time ago. So he invited me to his house and I went to his home and lo and behold, it was, it was one of the best archival collections I've ever encountered. It was just amazing. And here's John Paul sitting next to me with this incredible repository of documents going through each one, describing them um, and, uh, 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 and sharing all of his own labor. I remember as a doctoral student, people saying, oh, be careful, don't give too much away. It's a competitive business. And here's John Paul. Who cares about competition? We have, a, we have work to do. Uh, and we, we have work to do together. So that, uh, for me, was just such, uh, such a gift, a gift of, of knowing all of these people, including yourself, 
and 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 be part of this this scholarly community. Uh, we have a one question here. Uh, what about your hope for the field of Christianity in China? You started to say that you know this is a dynamic field or one that brings a sense of energy. Um, can you be more precise and um, offer some comments on that regard? Well, you know, uh, and the winds always are changing um, throughout the world as we all study. Right, the, 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 they really are. And um, this is where, you know, you admonished me not to talk about others. Um, and it's difficult not to do that because I've heard fundamentally of about 20 scholars talking about their hopes and desires. And I think I might be a bit uh, influenced by some of those remarks. Sure. Um, well, I, I have to say, one thing that that others did not remark upon, and that is is the the situation that we're now that we're now in, and its repercussions for the future. Um, I, I've just begun to receive some emails from scholars, junior scholars in our field, who have been laid off, and uh, because of this this pandemic uh, that we're going through now, and uh, these. The fact that some scholars in the field of China Christianity have one particular person has one year left before uh, there's no more employment. This to me is just a tragedy. And, 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 and I, I guess my hope is that this is, is resolved um, because one person's, well, they're all of their work that I've, these people I'm hearing, all their work is so significant and um, an institutional connection really does help facilitate this work. So I guess I hope that, um, I hope that this pandemic, uh, this situation that we're in now, uh, is resolved so that the, some many scholars can return to their work. And the other thing, I guess, I should say for me, in any case, I, I hope for a greater sense of collaboration and openness in the future. Uh, we already have that. Uh, but I guess I, I would particularly say, um, as much as I've really valued and loved my work in mainland China, and, and I'm eager to go back. Uh, mm -hmm. As much as I've loved that, uh, we are in a particular moment wherein it's, it's, it's more difficult and challenging to access materials. And um, I guess one hope is that as, as we hope for uh, more global expressions of friendship and collaboration, that includes also the academic community. And the academic community that studies religion, something that has some, become somewhat sensitive in some ways. Um, so I, I do hope that, that our particular field um, is given um, uh, more leniency, especially in, in mainland China, for, for scholars to consult uh, uh, documents. And, and that, will, that will, as you say in Chinese, yibu yibu, step at a time. Um, and then finally, for just my, my hope, uh, Many have said that there has that, that many have hoped for more collaboration between mainland Taiwanese Hong Kong scholars and Western scholars, and I share that. So I have to echo that that desire. Um, I, I sat next to uh, Dong Xiaoxin at a conference that you and I were at at Midlands in at the Midland in in Canada. Uh, Dong Xiaoxin was was sitting next to me, and he and I were exchanging thoughts. Uh, he's a mainland scholar, thoughts about the history of Christianity in China. And I should say that uh, that was very rewarding to me, very rewarding in, in, a, in a sense that uh, I go to China to do work. Of course, I love going to China to be there, but I'm often there just sort of working. Uh, he lives there and was raised there. And his particular view of this, this topic that I, that I love so much was very nourishing to me. So um, I guess I, I hope that that opportunity, that the opportunities like that uh, become more, more common. And two, I, I guess if I could say one thing to institutions, um, as institutions become a bit more corporate, I'm speaking of universities, perhaps a bit more professionalized, um, you know, health sciences becomes really significant, um, and, and all these things are very good, mostly. But... Um, but I, I guess I, um, I don't want the academic enterprise such as ours to somehow lose space to these other uh, uh, concerns such as 
you know, institutional survival or corporatization or, 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 or professionalized training programs. Um, I, I guess what I, I would say is I hope that institutions provide more financial and institutional support for people who really want to do this study of the history of Christianity in China or the theology of Christianity in China, because our particular field is a field wherein we deal with cultural encounter, cultural friendship, sometimes cultural conflicts. And I think that the more we understand this relationship between China and the West, between China and Christianity, the more we understand it and the more we work together on this topic, um, I, I wanna say I have a great deal of optimism that that would be a salutary, um, uh, that would have a, a very good effect uh, upon um, uh, on our, our world and our intellectual community. So um, those are my real hopes, hopes for openness, hopes for collaboration, hopes for more global uh, uh, collaborative work, and, and hopes for institutional support. Um, well, thank you very much. I'm going to have just one more added question, if you don't mind. I think it's an important question to be able to reflect on, and we'll go as long as you wish, but I think it's a, a, a perspective that probably other scholars who have met you and know of your um, scholarship and your participation would be interested in. You mentioned in passing, and I'm taking the liberty as an interviewer to ask this, you mentioned in passing your wife. And um, I believe that all of us who have been scholars or probably people who have been at Whitworth know that uh, like with you, they get her, and sometimes it probably would be with her, they get you. So perhaps uh, any comments about your scholarship really as a team um, and um, uh, that you'd like to regard and uh, that would you like to say anything about your wife's name, which I believe is Dr. Clark, Amanda Clark. Right, yeah. Well, I think you just asked me my favorite question. Um, <laughs> and uh, of course, you know us both very well. Yeah, you know, I, after my trip to um, China in, in 2010 with, uh, with Paul Mariani, um, I remember I was sending materials back from China. We, we would, I would photograph materials and then send them back to her and then she would process them and be in communication with us. And, and then uh, I think he was going to acknowledge me in his book, uh, Church Militant. And I remember him sending me an email saying, I realized early on that there's no Anthony Clark. There's, there's really Amanda and Anthony Clark. <laughs> And that's absolutely true. I mean, she's written a book on a Jesuit, the, one of the last two Jesuits to live in China during the mission era, uh, Charles McCarthy. And uh, uh, I would say there's never been a day uh, that I've worked on my topic that I haven't had some discussion with her uh, about this topic. And it's, our, it's really not mine. It's our topic. Uh, she is just... Um, uh, in fact, every time I publish something, a book, I, I, it's, it's, I guess the only person I really dedicate this book to is Amanda, because, of course, she's reading every word I've, I've written and has given me great advice, uh, has just produced so much of her own great scholarly uh, work and ideas. Uh, so um, I guess I would have to say then, too, you know, I think of, I, don't, it, like, I never want to compare myself to Will and Ariel Durant, but, but certainly it was Will and Ariel Durant. And if anything about my own work, uh, I would say half of what I've published and done, uh, at most I could have accomplished half. Um, she really is the, um, that, that, su that support and collaborator and, and companion and, and, uh, and is, is constantly correcting me. And I need that, I need that very, very much. So, and it is a, it is a, a quite a privilege to live with another scholar uh, who has a, 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 her own doctorate degree and who was a dean at, at my university. So that, that really has been a gift. And, and uh, we, we, we are already talking of future projects. And, um, and of course, her father is a very, very uh, famous architectural historian, Leland M. Roth. And uh, we've, we've thought quite a bit about future projects where we, Amanda and I, who sort of inherited that legacy of a, a good understanding of architectural history, we've talked about future projects and thinking about our, the architecture of uh, the, the, the architectural, Christian architectural history in China. Some good books have been coming out by Alan Sweeten, uh, by Thomas Kumans, uh, and, and that's something that we've thought about. So I'm glad that you asked that question because uh, if, if I'm being interviewed, really, uh, she should probably be here as well. <laughs> Uh, maybe we'll reserve that for another interview series. But yes, uh, certainly my own life and, and work couldn't be possible without her life and work. Yeah. 
Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Anthony Clark. And uh, I believe uh, if uh, you coordinated this interview, and I'm very honored to be a guest interviewer. And uh, Matt, why don't you bring this to an end uh, as you would like to close it and as you have closed other interviews, please. Well, um, first, let me just say thank you, Father Carboneau. What an honor it is to, to uh, have you interview me. Um, We've chatted so much over the years and um, and over the phone and in person that that really speaking with you is it, I, it, I, maybe I maybe said too much because uh, I have no sense of being careful about what I say because I'm just sort of used to having you nearby. So I should just say thank you and uh, uh, and, and and I share that that honor that honor of of having you interviewing me. So anyway, thank you so much. Okay, you're welcome. Uh -huh.